that we're going to do that quick recap of the last uh, two or three weeks, and then we'll hopefully continue today, and um, maybe one more week, we'll see. Okay, so what's the big idea? The big idea here is that in this week's Torah portion, I'm happy we started early. Finally, we got it to the Tanan, which is this week's Torah portion, and this is uh, this is uh, this week's Parsha, where Moshe keeps telling the people, reminding them about the story of Sinai, and reminding them about the revelation at Sinai, and enjoining them against idol worship. But he keeps using a phrase that is interesting because we're not so accustomed to hearing that phrase, that word. And he says, Viadaita, you should know. You should know. And then we had one of the questions that says, you, you have been shown to know and you should know, meaning you don't know yet, but you have already been shown to know. So that will get back to at the final chapter. But what we have right now is knowing. So that leads us to the discussion, which we started a few weeks ago, which is what is the idea of knowledge versus faith? Because in the Torah, it says no, but it also says, interesting that I don't think the Torah, the Torah does not say believe in Hashem. There is no such phrase in the Torah. Um, there's no such phrase in the Torah. The Torah does say that the Jewish people believe. There's a story by Aminu Bahashem. At the splitting of the sea, the Jewish people believed in God. But it doesn't say believe in God. The closest you're going to get is the, the phrase in the first of the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God. Now that's a statement. It's not necessarily a commandment. And there's a whole discussion here about whether or not there is a commandment to, be, to believe, whether there could possibly be a commandment to believe. But that's for another time. We may get there eventually. Not in this discourse. We may study a discourse about that. But the bottom line is we're going to think about the difference between knowing and believing. And what was the big idea that we discussed at length? Last we had two chapters, one on knowing and one on believing. And we said knowing applies to what could be seen and what could be sensed and what could be felt. And therefore... You don't say, I believe I have a soul. You say, I know I have a soul. How do you know? Because I see it. What do you mean you see it? You don't see it. You can't, you, can't, you can't take it to the lab. You can't tell me what color it is. But I see the life. I see the effect. I see here there's a body that's dead. Here there's a body that's alive. I see life. I see life as a soul. So I see there's a soul. So then we say, we based on the, on the verse of Job, in, 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 the, in Job, from my flesh, I know God, meaning extrapolate from the relationship between your body and soul and think about the world, the universe, and God. And just like you could sense that you have a soul, so you could also sense easy, relatively easily, just by paying attention, that the world also has a soul. The world is alive. And therefore, within the life of the world, you, sent, you could sense that this is Hashem. And therefore, the commandment, the idea to know God doesn't require faith. You could have faith. We'll get to the faith in a minute. You could have faith, but it doesn't require faith. Because the idea, it could be sensed. And if it could be sensed, faith is not required. That's what we said in section one. Then we go to section two. And we say, okay, so what is faith? And we say, faith is for that which the mind cannot grasp. And that's why you need faith. And what can't the mind grasp? The mind cannot grasp, not that Hashem exists, not that Hashem gives life to the world. That's, 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 that could be sensed. What the, faith cannot, what the faith cannot, what the mind cannot grasp is the transcendence what the Kabbalah would call or makif, the surrounding light. In other words, the fact that Hashem is infinite, the fact that Hashem is beyond, not just this world, but beyond time and space. And that is something no mind can grasp. And therefore, to relate to that, you can relate to that by your mind. You can only relate to that by your faith. That is what we said uh, in the first two. Last week, we started making some little progress into three. Um, so I'm just going to summarize the beginning, but I think we'll repeat it. What did we say last week? Last week we said, okay, but now the idea is to bring in some of that faith into knowledge. In other words, the question is, could you sense the transcendence of God? Could you sense the infinity? And could you essentially bring more of the encompassing light, the Soviet Kalam, the infinite light, could you bring that more into this world? Because as it stands, the life that gives life to this, to every creation in this world is memale, is the life that is imminent, the life that it fits, fills every creation. So obviously it's limited. You want to bring, we want to bring more of the infinite light into this world. We want to sense more of the infinite light in our life. And according to the Kabbalah, that's a major point of, of what the purpose of the Torah is, as we'll elaborate a little bit in a moment. And the key is going to be that the conduit, the way you bring the faith into knowledge, 
In other words, the way you bring the transcendent light into the space that you could be, you can be aware and sense and feel it, the way you can feel connected to the infinite light of God is not through creation, because creation is the finite expression of the en energy of God, through the commandments, through the, through the mitzvot. Mitzvot are Hashem's will, and mitzvot allow for the infinite will to be drawn down into this world. That is, um, that is essentially what we said last week, what we began well, the last two weeks, and we began the last three weeks, really, and we began a little bit to elaborate number three last week about the commandments bringing that infinite light into our awareness through the Torah and the mitzvot, and we elaborate upon that in number three, and then we get to number four, which is to show that we're in the process. Ultimately, that could be done in the Messianic era. And then in the end of four, we go back to the verses and we tie everything into the verses. So that is, uh, I guess, a quick summary. I don't know if it was four minutes or a little bit more. But that's the summary. Comments, questions are welcome. Otherwise, we'll begin to do uh, section three again. We'll read the beginning quickly because we started it last week. And then we'll get to um, some new stuff, God willing, in good health. Rabbi, a quick question? Yes. Okay, so in my own mind, so what you're saying is, if we look at this like a dance, we're, 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 we're sort of first bringing God we're lowering God to our world. We're making, we're noticing he's the God of nature and we're, 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 we're doing that. Then that's the conscious world. Then right. we go to the transcendent world and then we kind of elevate ourselves a little bit as we're approaching our partnership with, you know, Hashem. We bring him down, then we go up and then suddenly we're dancing, meaning that the, the conscious will lead to the subconscious. The, um, the, 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 the transcendence will become knowledge. And then the two will kind of parlay between themselves. Uh, and that's how we unite this kind of conscious and, and transcendent world together. Correct. Okay. And just wanted to be sure. And just to say, just to, just to show where we're going to go, in some sense, the mitzvot themselves are a dance. Because what he's going to show, that mitzvot could be, Kabbalistically, the mitzvot could be divided into three. Well, not just Kabbalistically. The mitzvot could be divided into three. And the three, one column is the mitzvot that are intended to draw the light of Hashem into this world. Another column is intended to us for go upward, right? So he's going down, we're going up, we're meeting halfway. And then there's the middle column, which is the column we, that I think what it, the idea is that it shows that we're, we get to the core and we realize that we're one and the same, we're connected. But the idea of going up and going down and we're doing multiple things at the same time, that is, um, that is going to be expressed with the Torah and the mitzvot as well. In other words, that dance is within the mitzvah as well. Okay. Beautiful. I was driving over here and thinking about, okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to make this relevant? And I, and I thought like, yes, I thought could be, it's right. I think it's true. So you have a conversation with you between two people, which is going to parallel, I think, what we're saying up till here. So you have two people. One person is going to say, I can't do it. I can't do it. You ask me to do something, I say, I can't do it. And then... Okay, so so uh, so so let's try to make this a little practical. And, and uh, so here you have the conversation. So the conversation is like this, two people. One person says... I can't do it. You ask me to do something, I say, I can't. I don't have the, the mental capacity. I don't have the emotional capacity. Be patient, be kind. I can't do it. The other person says, talking to this person and says, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You could do it. And the guy says, I know I can't do it. I tried, I failed. I know I can't do it. So that's the conversation. Now the question is, who's right? And based on the model that we put down here in the last three weeks, they're both right. In other words, what did we say? We said that knowledge represents, like let's say I say, let's say we say, I know God. So we said that represents the energy of God that's within creation that gives light to the creation, limited light. Okay, that's I know, I can sense it. Belief represents the transcendent infinite light of Hashem. 
you can't understand it. You can't see it. Well, I see the flower is alive, so I sense that's the that, that's God giving life to the universe. Okay, but that's the limited light of Hashem that comes into the creation. But what about the infinity of God? That I can't um, appreciate with my knowledge because my knowledge cannot grasp something that is truly infinite. So for that, I need faith. Okay. So by the same model within the person himself, you have the person's personality. Because again, the person, according to the Kabbalah, the person is a reflection of Hashem. And just like Hashem has these two models, the limited light that gives light to the universe and then the transcendent, we also have the same concept. So we're talking about the conscious mind, what the Kabbalah would call the 10 spherots. We can call the intelligence and the emotion, my personality. But then you have maybe what science would call the subconscious or the super, we would call the super conscious. But again, the old makifa in the surrounding light. And that is not in your, it's not in your consciousness. So for me to believe that I can do something that I know I cannot do, that would require faith. And what does faith mean? So we said earlier that the purpose of life is to bring the, the infinite light of God into this world. In other words, to bring more of the infinite light into the finite reality. Okay, within the person himself, I could do the same thing. I know I can't do something. How do I know? Because it's not within the current ability of my faculties. It's this understand to understand this is beyond me. To create that emotional response is beyond me. I can't do it. But my friend says, have faith, believe in yourself, believe that you could do it. Well, what does believe mean? Believe means touch the infinity of your soul, what the Kabbalah would call makif, the ones that hovers above you because it's too great to come within your consciousness. So I believe I have that potential, but that potential is not enough. Somehow I have to bring that potential into my conscious mind. How is that done? Well, in the world, it's done through fulfilling the commandments. You have to have a conduit which would bring the infinity of Hashem into this world. And I think the same is true about within the person himself. When I do a mitzvah, I'm not just bringing the infinity of God into the world. I'm also bringing the infinity of my soul into my consciousness. But it's the same model. The model is you have faith. I'm sorry, you have knowledge in the limited light that could be seen. You have faith in the transcendent light that is beyond. And then the idea is, could you bring more of that faith into the knowledge? Could you bring more of the infinity into the finite? And that's true in the model of Hashem and the world. That's one model we're operating in. And we're going to say in a minute, that's the purpose of the Torah and the, and the commandments, specifically the commandments in this context. But the same is true in the model within the person. We're too, that I have my consciousness. That's what I know about myself. I know this I could do. I know this I can't do. That is the sort of examination and the di uh, diagnose of my current consciousness, my conscious faculties, what I'm capable of doing, what I'm not capable of doing. And then you have the infinite, infinite part of the soul. And according to the Kabbalah, the infinite part of the soul is, is associated with the idea of will. Just like the Torah, just like the mitzvot are Hashem's will, you have your own will. And will is a very powerful tool. Because what the will does, the will is really a conduit from the infinite part of the soul to the conscious part of the soul. So if you really want to achieve something, you will be able to achieve it. Even though this morning, it was beyond your capacity. But if you awaken the will, oh, so the will is a way of bringing the infinite part of your soul to the finite part of the soul, which is the consciousness. So that same model, even though the Alta Rebbe, the Rabbi Shneir Zalman, doesn't elaborate upon here, upon, upon this here in this discourse, in the model, which is the per within the person, but based on all his other teachings, it's it's very clear that that same model that works between God and the world would also work within the person himself, the infinite, the transcendent part of the soul, finite part of the soul, and then the bridge. And the bridge is the will. And just like the will of, 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 uh, of God is the commandments, is the will of the person. And when you awaken the will, like the Kabbalists say, the will is the little key that could unlock any 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 faculty of the soul and bring additional energy within the soul. I think that uh, we discussed this in the past that sometimes you can have somebody who's not a great scholar in this topic, but if he has a vested interest, sometimes he can achieve something that the great scholar cannot achieve. And I think I said this before. I've seen this in my own in my own personal life that I've seen, uh, not my own life, but I've seen this in my in you know firsthand where you have legal experts that that. Um, are arguing a case, and then the party would come up with a legal argument that the experienced litigator would not come up with because it is relevant to the party. 
And if you want, if you care about it, if, if you want to succeed, you will not be surprised that you'll get an insight that the expert will not have. It happens every day. I've seen it in my own life. And that's the idea. That's the model that the will could unlock the other faculties. So that's a little bit, a little bit uh, broad. Um, again, comments or questions about that. Welcome. Otherwise, we're, we're going to go back to our to our text, and we're, the text is going to be focusing on: Could I bring the infinity of God into um, the finite reality within reality within the world? And that's going to be that's going to be that's going to be a little bit of what we're going to do in the next few minutes, and then hopefully we could make it practical as well. Go ahead, Dr. John. Yes, my question is this, Rabbi. As you know, I spent a lot of time dealing with people who feel they can't. And that's characteristic of people who are depressed. They feel they can't. Many of the great scholars, and I visited some of their graves when I was in the Ukraine, who, 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 who wrote and talked, were depressed themselves. How did they write and how did they use what you're talking about to lift their spirits, increase their energy, which is characteristically depleted in depression, so that they could go forward rather than, than, than continue to feel depressed? And how has that worked with people you know when they're feeling that they can't? And how, have, how do you use what you're describing of, whether it's a myth or whatever, to re-energize yourself? So the first thing I would say, I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> exactly how to do it, I don't know. Um, the, the, beyond that, the first thing I would say is it's important because I was while I was talking about it, I was thinking about this. I talked about the two person. The person says, I can't do it. And his friend says, no, you can't. That is, that is a little problematic because who's right? The person who thinks he can't is right. In other words, if you look at my current state in my conscious faculties, I can't achieve it. My finite reality cannot achieve it. I, don't, I can't do it. Now, I have the reservoir. I could tap in to what the Kabbalah would call the encompassing light of my soul. That's just above the consciousness. And if I tap into that, then I can have a reservoir of, first of all, energy, but not only energy, but also it increases capacity. I will be able to understand better. But right now, I can't. That He's right. So I'm right. I can't do it. Right now, I'm depressed. And don't tell me I'm not depressed because I am depressed. Right? So that my current state, my, my description, my diagnosis of my current state is that I can't. Now the question is, is this the totality, how you feel right now, is this the totality of my personality? And here, the job is to understand that, this, yes, it's true, I feel this way right now, but I can tap into something deeper. And how do I tap into something deeper? So there's different ways. The first thing is to try to create a will. And the first thing is, do you really want to? And I think that the scientists will agree, and I think you would agree, that if a person comes to you for help and they don't want help, they're not going to be helped, right? So the first thing, the first access point of connecting the my potential that hovers above me, makif, to my to to my conscious soul. The first and the first the most important avenue would be will. Now, how do you get somebody to want? Okay, so different ways. Well, sometimes you, depression is just physical. Go take a, go on a walk, right? Understand and picture what you want your life to be. Maybe write it down, right? So, how to create the will? That's why I say I don't know. Everybody's different. There are different ways, different tools to do it. Sometimes you go swimming, and sometimes you go sit in the sun. Maybe that will help. I don't know. There's different ways to do it. But the first point, but the point is you got to want to. If you don't want to, nobody, you can't grow. And the best doctor won't help you. And when you say, I can't do it, the answer is you're right. You can't do it. So, that, so that's, 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 that's the first point. I want to say one more point about, about, uh, about this, and then we'll take Bob's question. In Hebrew, you say mazal tov. Good luck, mazal tov. Literally, the etymology of the word mazal means a flow. So literally, if I want to wish you a good happy birthday or happy anniversary, I'm saying mazal tov, have a good flow. What am I saying? Have a, you should have a leak raining, leak down from your from the roof of your house into your house. What am I saying? So the Kabbalists say what mazal tov really means is you have that encompassing soul. Not most of the soul doesn't enter your consciousness because because most of your soul is too great to enter your consciousness. It's it's it's. I'm not going to call it infinity, but it's certainly in, in, infinite in comparison to your conscious soul. And when you give somebody a blessing, what you're really telling them, some of that transcended part of the soul should flow into your conscious mind. And that's mazal tov. You should have a, a, a good flow. And that would obviously bring blessing. And it also opens up your capacity to understand, to feel 
also to feel. I want to, I love you. I don't feel love right now. Well, do you want to feel love, right? Again, that love can help increase all of the capacities, all of the faculties. Okay, go ahead, Bob, please. I just wanted to offer a potential answer to John's question is that when we take our children and we try to infuse them with Judaism, we do it through, uh, through ritual, through Sunday school, through... So one way of approaching your patient who might not know where to start is baby steps, is maybe to go to shul, maybe to do a mitzvah, maybe to do something to kind of bring God down uh, and, and feel a bit of the transcendence. And so uh, alternatively to big steps in this kind of dance, you take baby steps and you just uh, through mitzvah, create that aura uh, and uh, bring them onto the playing field, so to speak. That's it. That, I just want, I want to jump in on that. I want to, I want to, I want to ride on Bob's words because that's what we're going to get to in a minute. And that is think about the power of action versus will. So ritual, doing something. Now it could be in the religious context, but it could be in any context. I don't feel like getting out of bed. doesn't matter. Go, every, every day at eight o'clock, you ride your bike or ride your bike, right? So action. And there's a, we're going to run into the principle here that according to the one of the earliest principles of, of earliest books of Kabbalah, the l- lowest is rooted in the highest and the highest is rooted in the lowest. In, I have my action. In some sense, it's the lowest part of my soul because it's very external. It's how I operate in the world outside of me. It doesn't affect how I understand or how I feel. So for example, I don't have to feel kind, but I could do an act of kindness. So that's action. So action is the lowest level. On the other hand, we see that sometimes action would trigger desire, would trigger will. So it bypasses the conscious mind. I, wa- I do something and then I want to do more of it. How did that happen? Wasn't I, wasn't I a little melancholy? Now, I'm, now I want to ride two miles after I rode one mile. What happened? Ah, the highest level is rooted in the lowest level. And that's why Judaism, and certainly from Judaism in general, but the Kabbalah highlights the, the me- mechanics of how, the, how this works, why we're so focused on action. Why is it religion? As a culture, we're so focused on action even more than on uh, a belief system, even we have a belief system, but that's not that's not that's not the primary. What's primary is action. And also what's primary is is, is action even more important than belief system and even much even more important than feeling. I don't feel kind right now. I don't feel like praying right now. Doesn't matter what you feel, just do it. Why? What are we trying to do? So the lowest and the highest are rooted in each other. And that action has the power to unleash the infinity. Now that's that, that's a rule of nature, how that of, of spiritual nature of mysticism, how that works. We can get into that, but that's the rule. So I think the power of ritual is ultimately is one tool to get into the will, and and simply it's take action that even if I'm not in the mood of doing it right now. So you can't make me feel good now, but you could make me do something. Because do something is not doesn't require a transformation within my heart, within my within, within, within my conscious state. I feel miserable. Oh, it's okay, feel miserable. But could you connect to the transcendent part of soul? Could you awaken the will? Well, I don't know how to do that. We'll start with an action. Ah, the action touches the will. The will allows the flow back into the consciousness. So that's the Kabbalistic model. We can elaborate on every step of the model, how it works. I don't know that right here is the space, but that's that's generally what we're trying to do here. And again, we're doing this, we're studying the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, the human soul, as we'll discuss in this text, the human soul actually mirrors the divine and therefore the same dynamic of the limited energy of Hashem that's in this world that we can see and we can sense and the transcendent infinite light that we can sense. We have to have faith and then we have to connect the two. The same thing could happen within, within the soul of every human being. So that is the story. That's the story. That's the introduction. Unfortunately, fortunately, the introduction took 29 minutes and then we could start reading the text, but that's okay. Now I'm going to read. I'm going to read it inside. I'm going to read a few lines inside, and we'll stop every few lines. If we don't understand every line here, it's okay. You can ask about it, or I'll explain it, or not. We're looking for the big ideas. We're not looking to get to, to explain every single line, unless something that, that that triggers your interest, and then I'm happy to talk about anything that is here. Okay. Let's share the screen if we can.
Okay, we'll read a little. We'll see what we get to. Now it is written in Psalms, dwell in the land and nourish the faith. What does that mean? The meaning of nourish is to sustain, meaning that we need to sustain and nourish our faith so that it should become more manifest until it becomes established in a person's heart to the point that he knows and feels as it, it as, as if he saw it with his own eyes, right? We finished explaining in section one and section two that there is the part of, of, of the existence of God that could be seen, that could be felt, that could be sensed. And then there's the transcendent, that's faith. And you can't sense it, you need faith. But now we're saying, oh, one second, could you sustain, could you draw down some of that faith into the consciousness of the mind that you can feel it and sense it? So let's see how that's done. And he says this level of experiencing one's, experiencing one's faith and in a, in a conscious way reflects the reality that we will experience in the time to come in the Messianic era, as it is written in Isaiah, the earth will be filled of the knowledge of Hashem. The meaning of the term the earth in this verse is a reference to a person's faith, which is called earth, just like the earth is the lowest level, since the person only has simple faith. Okay, let's stop here for a second. Let's think about faith for a second. Conventional view of faith Certainly, if you talk about blind faith, is that it's not very, it's not a great spiritual. In other words, people don't, especially in this culture, faith is seen as immature, especially certainly blind faith. It's immature. You say, I believe. What do you mean you believe? Because you don't have the capacity to think, so you believe. In, is that true or untrue? In some sense, it's true. And that's why we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to say that the, the idea of faith could be likened to earth because he wants to interpret the verse, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of Hashem. And we want to get to that and say that faith will be experienced as knowledge. So he's making an interesting point about faith as earth. What is faith? Faith is blind faith. It seems to be on a very low level because I don't understand. It's simple faith. But when it comes to simple faith, you could look at it and say, it's just immature. It's just sort of below knowledge. But remember the principle, as he's going to allude to here, that the, root, the end is rooted in the beginning and the beginning is rooted in the end. If something looks very simple and if something looks very uh, um, um, primitive, in some sense, it can actually be a conduit to something much, much more profound. The highest and the lowest are connected. In other words, is faith simple faith? Is it, um, is it primitive? Yes. But that primitive, that primitive faith can touch what the mind cannot touch. Because we're not talking about faith that a person believes because he doesn't want to investigate. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a person investigates as much as he can, understands the existence of God, but it's impossible for him to understand the transcendence of God, the infinity of God, which is impossible. So, so I have faith in the infinity of God. So now what happens is the most primitive, simple part of my personality, which is faith, allows me to connect to the deepest parts of, the, of, of God. So what happens is the lowest and the highest are connected. So let's not get offended when he calls faith earth because earth has that capacity. On one hand, it's the lowest. It's low. It's the it's it's the lowest thing. If you talk about forms of life, you have you have a human being. You have an animal kingdom. You have veg, vegetation, and the earth is the lowest form of life. And yet, the earth, the lowest form of life, can produce for the higher forms of life. So that's that model of the highest and the lowest are 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 related. And the same thing is with with faith. So faith represents earth. And then Isaiah says. What's going to happen is, and what we try to do is fill the earth with the knowledge of Hashem, bridge the knowledge and the faith, make more of the transcendence of God being able to, or the infinity of God, or conversely, the infinity of your soul, could you bring that into your consciousness? And now we're going to say how it's done. So let's see. Let's read another few lines. We'll see how this works. Go ahead, doctor. Wash, sir. I'm, uh, what you're saying is very profound, so thank you. And Bob, thank you for your comments as well. I appreciate them, and they make a lot of sense. Uh, the Rabbi, my question is this. We're talking about the, the, the power of faith, and we're talking about the fact that it's real rather than primitive. If I have faith in myself and I'm going into a meeting, I'm going to feel empowered. I'm going to feel strong. I'm going to convey a different impression. I'm going to look at you differently. I'm going to feel a certain sense. So my faith, if I don't have faith in myself, I'm going to go in like a deflated balloon. If yeah. I have faith in myself, I'm going to go in with full confidence that it's going to work out. And so I'm trying to make bridge. In, okay, in so here's, what, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what I'm trying. We have to go back a little bit and we have to deconstruct the word faith. And we, we, we spent two weeks doing it and it's very 
different than the conventional interpretation of language. The way I like to say it is, you know, people say seeing is believing. And we're saying seeing is not believing. If I see it, I don't have to believe it. If I believe it, I don't have to. If I believe it, it's because I can't see it. But let's go back to your mob. Let's say I'm very nervous. Why? Because I have to walk into a meeting and I have to make a presentation and I have to, or I have to give a class or I have to impress people. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Now, I'm, what would be the source of my confidence? So D Dr. John says, I believe in myself. I would say, no, that's not the source of my confidence. What am I going to, what is the source of my confidence? I know myself. I did this a thousand times. I have experience and I have no problem. So remind myself, Menachem, you're good at this. You do this every day. You could do it in your sleep and you can make this presentation and you can close the sale and you can, uh, and you can heal the patient and, and you, can, you, do, you do this. You do this for 50 years. You're okay. You, do, you can do this, right? That is not faith. I don't have to believe in myself. I have to be confident in my abilities that I already have. So I say, really what I'm saying is, I know I can do it. I know I can do it. That's the answer. Now, comes sometimes I approach a situation I have no experience in. Here, I can't walk into the meeting and say, I know I can do it because I don't know I can. I've never done it. So yes, I try my hardest in other fields. I'm a person, I have some experience. But when it comes to this specific question, I say, nothing in my experience tells me I can do it. Here is where I say, believe in yourself. And this believe in yourself, you could say, laugh at it and say, it's primitive. Why do you believe, based on what? What does this faith believe that? You can do it. You never did it before. How do you know, right? So in one sense, the faith is very primitive because I can't back it up scientifically. I can't prove that I can do it. On the other hand, that faith allows me to touch into what, I, what we're calling the makif, the transcendent light of the soul, the infinite part of the soul. And it says, you can do it even if you never try to do it. Now, does that mean that tomorrow when I want to do something, I shouldn't try to do it? I, I, I don't have to um, um, express and practice my skill, my craft? No, that's knowledge. So usually we're, we're operating in, do I know my stuff? My, do I know that I know how to do it? Don't approach the project unless you know how to do it. But the point is, if you're just operating in the known and in things that you already know how to do and you're just developing, and then when it comes to a situation which you never faced, you're not going to be able to tackle it and you're not going to be able to achieve something that is beyond your current capacity. So for that, you need faith. Is that faith primitive? The answer is, if someone says yes, they're right. Is that faith a tool to get to the infinity of your soul, a super powerful tool to allow you and give you confidence to walk in and make the impression, even though I have no experience, then that the answer is it's both. It's primitive and it's also the deepest. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, so, 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 so it's very powerful. I'm reading the book. I forget which, uh, what was the book? There's one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. I forget already which one. It's all one big mix, but he talks about one of the top bankers of the United States and he had no experience and he rode with the guy in a taxi and he made the impression and he got the job. And he was also dyslexic, dyslexic, I think. And the bottom line is he had faith and he went with it and he won and he succeeded. So, but on the other hand, that you don't, don't use that skill every day. What you're supposed to be doing is saying, do I know I know how to do this? Can I learn how to do this? And then at that point, I don't need faith. I have knowledge. I know I can do it. That's the answer. But on the other hand, sometimes the knowledge is not enough because the problem is too big or too new. And then don't limit yourself to what you know how to do. You have to believe that it could be done. So the answer is both are necessary, but the faith on one hand is primitive. On the other hand, it's a tool to tap into the deepest parts of the soul. Go ahead, go ahead, please. I'd like to just bring, as, as perhaps I do, bring the profound back to the prosaic. Yes. And I think the finals at Wimbledon this year. Alcaraz is playing Djokovic. Djokovic has won many, many times. He knows he can win. Alcaraz is a great comer. He's 20 years old. Uh, he has he doesn't know he can win. He has to believe he can win. I don't, I don't, I never entered his mind, but somehow he finally wins in the fifth set. What goes on uh, utilizing Kabbalistic knowledge? What goes on in the mind of someone like that who has no he knows he's one he he had won uh, prior tournaments, but uh he, but he, there has to be, it has to be a huge element of belief in there. No question about it. And that's why I, think, I don't know about this player specifically, but many players are superstitious in the sense they have, they have, a, they have a superstition, whatever that superstition is. They do this to win. They do that to win. The bottom line is, and you say, you laugh at it. You say, well, it's, it's silly. How could somebody that's so, uh, uh, that honed the skill and understands 
that the skill is, it understands what the skill is and understands how many years it takes to develop the skill and how nobody else has the skill. How is this guy open to faith? How could you say, I think, I, I believe that I can do it. You know, you, you know, look at the charts, you know that it's, that, it's a, that it's a tall order for you. And the answer is they have faith. And is that faith primitive? Yes. And does that faith allow them to open up to greater potential? Yes. So which one is it? Is it the greatest faculty of the soul or is it the lowest faculty of the soul? The answer is it's both because the highest is rooted in the lowest. Now, does it mean that if I just have faith, that's all I live my life on faith, I'm going to crash into the wall. If I don't, if I don't hone a skill, if I don't understand, I have, I, have to, I have to work on the knowledge, knowing, meaning work on my limited consciousness, be able to understand more, be able to feel more, be able to express myself better. That is not faith. That is knowing that you can do it in the model of our model. It's mamale. It's the limited light of Hashem that enters the world. In the model of the soul It's the limited capacities of the soul, what we would call personality. What the Kabbalah calls the tenth spherot, the, 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 the intelligence and the emotion. And you have to work to develop and expand your ability to understand and your ability, ability to feel and ability to understand your emotions and navigate your emotions. All that is important. But if you just have that and you don't have faith, then you're not touching in, you're not tapping into the infinite part of soul. And what's the infinite part of soul? Will, desire. And I'll tell you about something about will and desire. If that guy doesn't want to win, doesn't really, really want to win, and if he doesn't have a deep pleasure in the game, he is not going to be able to tap in. Faith alone is not going to do it. He's not going to be able to tap in to that infinite part of the soul. Because the Kabbalah says that the, that the infinite part of the soul, the way it expresses itself is will and pleasure. Will and pleasure. So I don't have to. And if I don't have that, don't, don't show up to work. In other words, no, you could show up to work if, 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 if you're talking about, no, I know, I know, I know, I know how to do this. If I know, I know how to do this, I don't need, I don't need faith and I don't need will. But if I don't know I know how to do this, and I'm relying on faith, you have to really want it. And will, ratzon, is the conduit to get to the essence of the soul, to the conscious, to the consciousness. It's the conduit to getting to the transcendence of God into this world, and that's what we're going to focus on the next step, the way you bring soivev and mamale, which is Kabbalistic code for transcendent light to the, to the finite light. The way you do that is through the mitzvot. What are the mitzvot? Hashem's will. But I don't understand how Hashem's will is going to help. Will. Will is the is, is he wants it. Will is the bridge between the infinite and the finite. So you really have to want to win, win this game. And if you don't want to win this game, then you better know how to do it. Because if you don't know how to do it, your faith is not the faith is not going to do it. Now, faith. But well, what's the will based on? I want to do it, but I, so I, so I believe that I can do it. What well, based on what? Based on nothing. Okay, so it's primitive. No, based on that I sense. I'm not totally illogical. I sense that I have infinite capacity. I sense that I can tap into a reservoir that's more than my conscious mind. I sense that I have a superconscious. That's, that's essentially what's happening here. So this is very profound and very deep and very practical. Thank you, doctor. Whenever you're here, I become more of a practical person because I have this tendency that I could just go to, 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 to space and be in the abstract. So thank you. Rabbi. Go ahead. Please forgive me, others here, because this is so profound and so relevant that the rabbi has been really excited this morning. <laughs> rabbi, there's a whole new framework to the concept of willpower. Will yeah. and willpower has been so discredited in many ways by psychoanalysis that it's almost like, well, willpower is overridden by the unconscious. And what you're saying is you're connecting willpower to spirituality, which I find very appealing and very profound. And just to put it in your terms, willpower is the conduit to the subconscious. And the subconscious, we're not in the negative sense, but in the positive sense. The subconscious means the capacities that are beyond what my con the, what, what, what my conscious mind is experiencing or what my conscious emotions are experiencing. So I, I have that positive. You know, I think that the difference between where I come from and you come from, in other words, the science of, of, of psychology, I think they look at, correct me if I'm wrong, that subconscious is a mess, right? Subconscious is all the negativity lurks or some negativity lurks. And we agree with that, but we also think that subconscious is the space also where the capacity of the soul is, right? So we have, a, I think, I'm, not, I'm, no, I'm no expert. I'm just talking as a layperson about psychology, but I feel like that we would look at the subconscious and say, you, that's what we need to tap into. How do you tap into that? Will. You have to want to, but, 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 but I don't want to. Okay, so that's what I said. I don't know. So you have to create the will. One way to create the will, ritual, action. Why? Lowest and highest are, are, are connected. Believe in yourself. What does that even mean? 
I don't have experience. Okay, so there's the part that I know I can do it. And that's very good for those situations. And then there's the part, and by the way, that, that gives me confidence. Sometimes that gives me confidence. That I, if, like if I know I know how to do one thing good, then especially with children, it's that way. If they know how to do one thing good, then they then, then, then they can extrapolate. Oh, so if I really try that, it means I can apply my, those skills to something else. And I could grow in that area as well. So they're both important. You have to have the knowledge of what I know I can do. And then what I don't know I can do, but I have faith. So based on what is that faith? The faith is primitive. Yes. But that, that, that primitiveness allows me to connect to something that is beyond my consciousness. And, and, and one way to access the faith is will. One way to access the will is action. Because what is the mitzvah? A mitzvah is an action. Every single mitzvah, almost every mitzvah will have an action. And the action will say, well, this taps into Hashem's will. So the will and the action are related. Okay, go ahead, doctor. And then we'll do a few more lines inside. Go ahead. Apologize to all the rest of you. It's irrelevant. Otherwise, I'll shut up. And my point is this. I see what you've said gives prayer a new meaning. In other words, you're talking about action and mitzvah. And of course, prayer is one of them. But I'm thinking to myself, prayer is an extraordinary way, presumably, I'd like you to amplify on this, of increasing will. In other words, if I want and I desire, but I'm struggling between, I don't know if I can and maybe, and I'd like to have the power of special, I'd like to have the power of the Rebbe, I'd like to have the power of Martin Luther King, I'd like that. But let's talk about the role of prayer in enhancing That's will. Good. That's good. So we'll talk about prayer in a minute because we're going to mention prayer. It's one of the three columns of the mitzvot. But I was just going to say, part of prayer, even before, so prayer brings faith, even before faith, what am I, prayer is an act of hope. Prayer means, first of all, even before, I know what I want. If, 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 if if I can wake up in the morning and say, God, I'm praying for A, B, and C, that puts me in a very good space. First of all, before anything else, that means I define what I want. I define what I need. That means I'm thinking beyond the immediate of what I'm having for lunch, right? So the ability to think about, plan my day. What do I want for my day? What do I want from, from this period of my life? What do I want from uh, this, this situation I'm in, right? So just to be just the ability to be able to, to uh, um, 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 formulate, uh, formulate, formulate what I want already crystallizes what I want. And that's already forces me to think about what do I really want? Because I want, but the problem, part of, part of the problem with the makif, the encompassing light is I want a lot of things, but those things that I want are not always in the consciousness of my mind. But if I think about it, and if I have to talk about them and I have to formulate them in a certain way, then it makes me, it brings that um, will to the front burner. What do I really want? And most people don't ask that question. They're asking, what do I want? They're asking which flavored ice cream I want. They're talking about very immediate. But in the broader question, what do I want from my life? What do I want from, from, from this decade? What do I want from this relationship? Most people are too busy to ask that. And now, so, so, so that's okay because I have will, but the will is above. Now, if you have to formulate it, I'm bringing part of that will into my consciousness. Now, prayer is for, for first and foremost, formulate what you want. Now, we're not so good at doing this, so we have a text, which is a prayer book, which has certain advantages and certain disadvantages when you make it formal, but that's another discussion. The bottom line is formulating what I want helps me understand, helps me make my goals, and then, and then prayer is certainly an act of faith because basically what I believe I'm doing is I believe I'm tapping in to the energy that will is able to get help me get what I want. God has the capacity to help me. So you see how much... Uh, hope that would bring but i know right now i can't do it okay that's what that's the that's the part that's the finite part of reality that's my consciousness that's what we would call um the imminent light the light that's limited within my consciousness but then can i tap into something that's transcendent that's infinite so prayer is one of the ways of doing that so so so, so prayer is very is, is very much helpful to connect to connect to connect to that and within with, within all the commandments, we'll talk about what prayer is. So there's, there's some mitzvot, I'm, uh, Bob talked about the dance, some mitzvot I'm drawing light down, and other mitzvot I'm going up. And prayer has a little bit of both. We're going to focus on the part that I'm going up, because the, 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 the um, introduction to the prayer is creating love to God. And love is trying to elevate myself. And once I elevate myself, then I have the 18 blessings of the Amida, which formulate what I want. And then, and then I bring that down. So there's a the dance of going up and down. So let's read a few more minutes because we did a lot of good talking, but I want to do, do a little a, li a little bit more of the text and then we'll hopefully we'll be done before 11. So we're not going to keep you here all day, but let's, let's read a little. This line is very important. Um, 
in Hebrew, well, in Hebrew and in English, I'm, 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 I'm going, the idea that our simple faith is compared to earth is expressed in the, in, in the teaching of Sefer Yitzira, Book of Formation, chapter one, section seven. And this is what we keep quoting. This is sort of one of the earliest capitalistic texts of all times. The beginning is wedged in the end, right? So, and and the, uh, the end of the quote is the end is wedged in the beginning. There's always wedged in the beginning. There's always a connection between the highest and the lowest. So faith is the lowest. It's the most primitive. It's the earth. Earth meaning the lowest form of life. On the other hand, it has the capacity to bring the highest levels. This means that the beginning and the highest level of the soul is expressed specifically in the simple faith, which is the end and the lowest level. Okay, let's read a little further. Then we say, what's going to happen when Mashiach comes? This level of simple faith will become filled with knowledge, meaning it will become consciously perceived and experienced as if the individual sees that it is written, as it is written, the glory of Hashem will be revealed and all flesh will see together. Meaning to say, he's re reinterpreting the verse that um, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God to mean that earth is faith, knowledge is knowledge. We want to bring the faith into the knowledge. Okay, let's read a little bit more. Now, the ability we receive from Hashem to internalize our faith and make it more manifest is through the Torah and the mitzvot and the commandments. Okay, this is getting a little Kabbalistic, a little spooky, but let's see. Regarding them, it is written, it says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. This means the 240 mitzvot, eight mitzvot are called in Tikkun Zohar, the 248 limbs of the king, corresponding to the 248 limbs of a human, since the word Adam, man, is connected to the phrase Adame, will will be similar will will be similar corresponding to the Most High. Okay, let's see. Um, these two hundred forty eight mitzvot draw down Hashem's infinite light from the level of Soviv Kalamin, How Hashem encompasses all the worlds, and in general, the two hundred forty eight mitzvot are divided into three categories, referred to as the right side, the left side, and the middle. Okay, we'll stop here for a minute, and we'll make the point here, and then we'll see if we'll continue or, or continue next week. There's an interesting zo. So we start with the with the verse. The verse in, in, in Genesis says, God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And of course, the question is, does God, God has no image. God doesn't have an image. So what are you saying? Like, how could man be made in God's image if God has no image? So there are many answers to that question. One answer is, like Maimonides' answer is, it's a metaphor for free choice. God has free choice. The human being has free choice. No other creature, including angels, have free choice. And therefore, we, God says, let us make man in our image. He's not referring to a physical image. <clears throat> He's referring to the concept of free choice. That is Maimonides' answer. The Kabbalistic answer is that God is infinite. God has no image. But God, there is an image that God expresses his infinity in a finite way. That's the image. And, and, and the Zohar talks about this. And I'm going to hope I'm not, I'm just tr trying to get this as quick as possible. There's 200, according to the Talmud, there's 248 limbs within the person. So you can category, you can slice it any way you want. Assume, let's assume that, that let's assume that that's the case according to that 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 division. So the Zohar says, if the Talmud says there are 248 limbs within the person, or body parts within the person, and God and the Zohar and the Zohar said and the verse says that God is making us in His image. So the Zohar says a very radical statement. What seems radical seems her 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 heretical on the, on, on, on the surface. The Zohar says Hashem also has 248 limbs. If we have 248 limbs, Hashem has the 48, 248 limbs. Now, the Talmud says that the 248 positive commandments correspond to the 248 limbs of a person. Okay, so by, by, by extension, 248 positive commandments correspond to God's 248 limbs. What does it mean God has a limb? Okay, so what's a limb? So a limb is a vehicle for the light of the soul. What is a limb? A limb is not just flesh and bones, it's that too, but it's the ability for the soul to, 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 to accomplish something. Sight, sound, speech, movement, right? So a limb is a conduit for the divine, and for the human and for the human soul. So what we're saying here is like this. So as a metaphor, Hashem is infinite, but could we make a limb for Hashem? A limb is just a fancy way of saying, could we make a, 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 a vessel? Could we make a conduit? Could we allow for the infinite light of Hashem to be brought down into this world? And the answer is that's exactly what the mitzvot are designed to do. Every mitzvah is Hashem's will. It, so it's lowest and highest. It's lowest because it's an action. It's the highest because it's Hashem's will. And we said will is super conscious. Will is the, the, the encompassing light, the infinity. And a mitzvah allows us to bring some of that into our consciousness. And then we'll continue and talk about how the mitzvot are divided into three. Right, left, center. We go up, we go down, we feel connected. 
and then um, and that's how and that's how we, and, that, and that's the dance, like Bob called it. That's how we keep trying to bring more of the infinite into the finite until eventually, uh, when the coming of Mashiach, we'll be able to sense. That's dot knowledge. We'll be able to sense the infinite light in this world. Right now, we don't sense the infinite light. What we sense is the the, the imminent light, the light that's limited. You walk outside, you see the flower, you see you see the world coming to life. You see the life of the world. That's the limited light that you sense. When Mashiach comes, we'll be able to sense the infinity. So that's the story in short. A lot more to say, but I think I think well I think that will be it for today. And hopefully next week we'll be able to make some more progress and maybe eventually finish the discourse. And then. Um, like Bob said, as soon as Rosh Hashanah, maybe we have to stop thinking of Rosh Hashanah discourses, but we'll, 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 we'll see. We'll, we'll leave that to the uh, planning committee. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, wonderful Shabbos. Comments, questions are always welcome, but wonderful Shabbos and only good news and good health. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Thank you. Be well, Vicky. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Thank you. Shalom.